Now that we have a handle on how to regulate blood pressure and what blood pressure is, is, let's look at some disorders related to blood pressure, and those would be hypertension and circulatory shock. So first, hypertension. Now in hypertension, the cause of hypertension can be a couple different things, um, there, or we can think of hypertension as divided into two types. One would be primary hypertension. This is the when the hypertension is the problem to begin with. There's no underlying comorbidity or other disease causing the hypertension. Hypertension is the problem. Typically, this type of primary hypertension is slow to progress, that it takes several years for um, the hypertension to build up or the high blood pressure to be pronounced. The, there's no direct un, underlying cause. It can be a combination of things, both genetic and environment, diet, obesity, age, diabetes, stress, smoking, all of those could affect and cause hypertension. Um, the secondary hypertension is often more quick to set in, and it's usually because there is some underlying condition that results in it, such as renal problems, so the kidney can't regulate blood pressure anymore, drug interactions that have the side effects of hypertension, adrenal gland problems because there's too much norepinephrine, so there's the initial problem results in hypertension when we're talking about secondary hypertension. This can end up leading to your heart having to work too hard because you've increased your afterload. So now the myocardium is going to enlarge in response to this having to work harder against the greater pressures. And over time, that puts so much strain on the myocardium tissue that it actually is strained beyond its capacity to respond. That is, it just cannot deal with it and it ends up becoming weakened and what they call flabby. Another thing that can happen with that is that you get, with the hypertension, is you get acceleration of atherosclerosis. And so you're going to end up having buildup of, that, of those atherosclerotic plaques much faster. Some pharmaceuticals that can be used to treat chronic hypertension include beta blockers. Beta blockers are going to slow your heart rate down. They're going to reduce the contractile strength of the heart and therefore that would lower cardiac output, which lowers blood pressure. Diuretics, of course, means you pee more, so then your blood volume goes down, so that would mean lower blood pressure. Alpha blockers, remember alpha adrenergics, those receptors cause vasoconstriction, so let's block those, so now we have vasodilation, reducing um, resistance, which means blood pressure goes down. ACE inhibitors, remember ACE is the enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. So now I have less angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is responsible for increasing blood pressure. So since I don't have as much, I'm going to have a lower blood pressure. Calcium channel blockers are going to block calcium entry into the heart. So that's going to end up reducing contractility for one, so you have lower cardiac output, and the other is that these drugs also will cause blood vessels to dilate, so therefore I'm reducing um, resistance, and therefore that would also decrease blood pressure. Now let's look at circulatory shock. Now this is a life-threatening condition where the pressure, your blood pressure drops dramatically and therefore your, your risk of not being able to deliver enough oxygen to your cells, particularly your brain. This is not a primary disorder. It's due to some other event that led to the shock. So for example, there's vascular shock. This would be when you see severe vasodilation. The blood vessels just dilate, so your resistance goes down so low that it causes a drastic drop in blood pressure. Anaphylactic shock is a kind of vascular shock due to release of um, histamine, massive amounts of histamine, and in, usually because you have a severe allergic reaction to something. Neurogenic shock is basically a central nervous system reaction to some mental thing going on. So um, a person is overwhelmed with grief whatever it is that they then have their autonomic nervous system 
unable to work or regulate the blood pressure. So the blood vessels dilate, you go in shock. Septic shock is due to severe uh, bacterial infections. The bacterial toxins are notorious vasodilators. And so therefore, again, increased vasodilation and you end up with uh, lower resistance, lower blood pressure. Cardiogenic shock is from heart disease in the sense that your blood, your heart, excuse me, is unable to maintain a decent enough cardiac output. So your cardiac output goes way down, which means your blood pressure go down. So think you go in cardiac, cardiogenic shock when you're having a heart attack, for example, simply not enough cardiac output to get some blood pressure. Then hypovolemic shock is going to be blood or fluid loss. This could be hemorrhaging, for example, would be an easy way to look at thinking of hypovolemic shock. Severe vomiting or diarrhea that dehydrates you to the point that you blood pressure lowers too much or excessive burns where you lose a lot of fluids in that way could lead to hypovolemic shock. Now we also have compensatory mechanisms in play for us to deal with shock. This includes the baroreceptor reflexes that we've seen before. So the VMC, the vasomotor center, is going to cause vasoconstriction to up peripheral resistance and therefore that would help increase blood pressure. The CAC is going to increase cardiac output by increasing heart rate and stroke volume. We'll have fluid reabsorption in the capillaries. Um, increased uh, due to low blood pressure. Remember we looked at that with capillary dynamics um, that we saw that that drop in filtration and increase in reabsorption means we're reabsorbing more and up in our blood volume to up blood pressure. The kidneys are also going to respond by releasing renin which triggers the renin angiotensin aldosterone cascade um, in response to that low blood pressure and those angiotensin 2 and aldosterone are both vasoconstrictors and they both lead to the conservation of sodium and water. And then antidiuretic hormone as well is going to be secreted, which is going to lead to um, more water being reabsorbed and therefore um, being able to up your blood volume and therefore up blood pressure. Now, this kind of shows a summary of the things then that I just talked about going on. So imagine in hemorrhaging, which would be just an example of, of a low blood pressure or shock. So the pressure goes down, that's gonna get baroreceptors to fire. So we have decreased parasympathetic, increased sympathetic. The parasymp decrease in parasympathetic, increase in sympathetic means increase in heart rate, which means increase in cardiac output. Increase in sympathetic also means an increase in stroke volume. Both that's going to increase cardiac output. Both of those then will lead to an increase in arterial pressure. And then, of course, sympathetic discharge to the veins. We could have constriction of those veins, and that means an increase in venous return and end diastolic volume, that up stroke volume, which means high cardiac output and high blood pressure or sympathetic discharge to the arterioles would increase, that's gonna get the arterioles to constrict, that increases peripheral resistance, and therefore you get an increase in blood pressure. Now shock's not a pleasant thing. Typically a person who's going to shock has a lot of things going on that, um, that active intervention is required, typically when compensatory mechanisms no longer work, if there is no intervention, things go crazy. And things just keep going farther and farther away because you're going to have further hypoxia, lack of oxygen, which means you're going to have a buildup of lactic acid. So you end up with lactic acidosis, which is a, a low blood pH. The vascular system is going to begin to fail because the arterioles aren't getting the oxygen. They're going to become unresponsive to catecholamines, the norepinephrine and epinephrine. And therefore, instead of vasoconstriction, you get dilation. And that means the shock even becomes worse. And now you've got sluggish blood flow, which means you're gonna end up with thrombosis, blood clots, and more, and even more severe tissue ischemia because there's the thrombosis, the blood clots are blocking blood flow. So now your blood pressure goes lower. You're gonna have narrow pulse pressure. The heart is gonna try to compensate by increasing heart rate 
So you go into tachycardia. Uh, the kidneys don't have enough pressure in order to filter the blood, and that leads to their to failure, or you get acute renal failure. Because you're not getting oxygen to the brain, you have acute um, decreased levels of consciousness, um, increased respiratory rates, again, in an attempt to get oxygen to the tissues, and into the, or into the blood and then the tissues. And then, of course, without, with the buildup of CO2, I should say, in your blood, you can end up with both metabolic and respiratory acidosis, which we'll see when we talk about uh, the different types of alkalosis and acidosis more towards the end of the semester. So that's it for our understanding of hypertension and progression of shock. And that's going to end our video lessons on um, cardiovascular system.